Um, hi, I'm Trisha. I work for Gradle, uh, Gradle Inc. And I'm Holly, and I work for Red Hat. I help build Quarkus. And when we started to think about doing this talk and, and what we each did, it seemed like maybe we had had nothing to talk about because there was no resemblance between our jobs. So I, I work on Quarkus. One of the things that we really try and do with Quarkus is developer joy, whereas Trisha works on Gradle, and what they're doing is developer productivity engineering, which sounds like the exact opposite of joy, right? Right, yeah. exactly. So developer productivity, and especially developer productivity engineering, it's all about measuring stuff and being productive and producing things. But actually, what we really want to talk about from an engineering point of view, when we talk about developer productivity, is joy and happiness and how engineering away these problems make us happier in our jobs. And I've just realized I have no idea what this is. That's much better. Now that I know what the next slide is. <laughs> yeah. Although I don't have my glasses on, so I'll be like, no. what is that? All oh, right, okay. So yes. yes so we have, we have covered, are these opposites are the same. Um, but then the sort of, that then comes back to kind of a, a bigger question about is, is our job supposed to be fun? Kevlin yesterday mentioned this idea of like, if we go to work, are we, are we allowed to have fun? Is, is, is that a goal? Is that a defect? Is it a feature? I do feel like asking management more, for more time to have fun is not a conversation that's going to go down very no. well. C career tip, <laughs> avoid the word fun when you talk to your management. Well, that's why we've been talking about DPE, developer productivity engineering. By the way, it's fun, but don't tell anyone because it is the same thing, effectively. Um, we were looking for, we might trample over each other with these slides because we both kind of have things to say on all these things. We, um, I was looking for a quote a little bit further on in this uh, presentation, and I came across uh, a Fred Brooks article about, um, it was called The Tar Pits, actually, and about how work can become, like, tedious and difficult. But in this, he talks about the joys of the craft. Why is it that programmers enjoy the job that they do, which effectively a lot of us do. A lot of us got into programming because we enjoy it. And he was talking about this in 1970, 80-something. It just goes to show any thought you've had, Fred Brooks had it first and probably said it better. So we should all just give up now. Just read the book and quote him instead of yeah. coming up with anything else. So he says, um, there are five things which contribute to why we enjoy our jobs as programmers. The first is the sheer joy of making things, which I think a lot of us can kind of relate to. I, I, every time I think about making, I think about you with a hat in that presentation where you did like, you made a hat and you coded it and it never worked, but it was very fun. Yeah, I made the world's first cuddly throwable application server. It was a very misguided demo. It was an awesome talk. <laughs> so th we love making stuff. And I think that particularly with coding, we're making stuff in, in a much lower maintenance way than, than making a ha application server. Um, and something else that we like is the pleasure of making things that are useful to other people. A lot of what, we, what we're doing when we're coding is something that hopefully users will use and say, great, my life is easier now that I'm using this thing. And that's quite satisfying. The fascination of fascinating, of fashioning complex puzzle-like objects of interlocking moving parts and watching them work. Certainly there's a certain subset, and we, uh, this was mentioned in the other keynote yesterday about how many gamers and puzzle solvers get into programming because we kind of like to figure out how things work and how to get things to work together or how to fix things that aren't working together. And so that's another part of why we enjoy doing what we do. The joy of always learning. <laughs> I was a bit. I wasn't sure about this because I think that in the in the job as developers, I think we have a bit too much learning sometimes, and it can be very overwhelming and intimidating. But I think those of us who succeed in this role are the types of people who do enjoy learning because if you don't, you're in trouble. And, and there's, the there's another. Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you because we're going to interrupt each other all the way through the talk because there's another <laughs> career tip there too that you didn't even ask for, which is if you're in a job and you find you've stopped learning. That is your indication that you should move job because we love learning. That is, oh no, I've gone back to the beginning. Um, yes, I used that was, sorry, we are going to tangent ourselves. Every time I w came to update my CV and if I hadn't added something new to my CV, it was time to leave that job because I hadn't learned anything new. So yes, top tip. Number five, the delight of working in such a tract tractable medium. And this to me ties into number one, the sheer joy of making things but in a medium which is relatively low cost. We don't need to buy materials. We don't need to plug stuff together. We don't even need to, like, um, I'm reminded of when uh, I did a 
clay pot making workshop with my husband's uncle and we actually like have to buy clay to make stuff and one of the things that he taught us is that you actually have to throw things away you do stuff as practice and throw it away um, and the the exercise is the doing not the end product and we can do that in IT really easily we can just produce code and throw it away we don't do that we should do that more. Yeah. Whereas when I when I made the cuddly throwable application server, the the application server part of it was easy. The cuddly throwable part, uh, it made me appreciate code so much because every time I would make a mistake, I really would almost have to you know undo everything and start all over again. Whereas with code, you can just make a small change and it does what you want, or it does something that isn't what you want, but at least it's different from what it was doing before. Right. So, and then I asked the internet and said, why do you enjoy your jobs? And they all agreed with me. So that's, that's the point about this slide. <laughs> and so, so then we have, a, you know, a little bit of a paradox, right? Because Fred Brooks said coding is fun. We all know coding is fun. And yet, probably, you know, some of us, when it gets to Monday morning, don't think amazing. We think, oh. So what, why is there this gap between this job that in theory should be really fun and the reality? I've realized if I stand over here, I can't see the next slide. <laughs> Just stand over here. over here. Right. Oh, sorry. Did you click oh, it? Yes. No. This is um, pair programming with slide. Oh, oh no. <laughs> you click. You click. I will click. OK. So um, one of the things we talk about with DPE is the toil and friction of our jobs. So we like the coding, and that's fine. But that's not what we spend a lot of our time doing. Certainly, it doesn't feel like we spend our time doing the stuff that we want to do. We spend a lot of time doing other stuff. We spend time waiting for builds or waiting for tests or waiting for Bob to get back to us from accounting to tell us we can buy the IntelliJ IDEA license or deploying or you know, largely waiting and context switching. And, and one of the sort of the, the things about this kind of drudgery is it's a little bit like frog bro boiling because we don't really notice it creep up. So like, you know, the build takes two minutes when we start the project and it's amazing. And then it takes three minutes and then it takes four minutes. And then two years later, you're still on the same project and the build takes 24 hours and nobody has really questioned it because each little worsening was incremental. And so our jobs get to, they start off perhaps something which is fun, but they incrementally get worse. And we don't even notice that we have a job that we don't really enjoy anymore. So can we fix this? Well, it seems like maybe one easy fix, <laughs> the fix that we all want to do, let's write more code, right? That solves the problem. We get back to the Fred Book Brooks bit. But another thing that Fred Book Brooks found was he, f he looked at projects and over the lifetime of a project, he found that each developer on the project had written 10 lines of code a day, which is pretty terrible, right? Because if we're developers because we want to, want to write code and we're only writing 10 lines, that's, that's bad. Now, as we may have mentioned, Fred Books was writing a long time ago. And so when you look at that 10 lines of code figure, you probably think, oh, well, yeah, but he was writing in like PL1 or COBOL or something. Of course, Punch cards or something like that. Yeah, of course they were only writing 10 lines of code a day. But very anecdotally, People still discuss this figure, and people come up with numbers, even in 2024, when we have all of the advantages that we have in 2024, like not working in PL1, and people get sort of similar numbers. So one recent number was 12 lines of code a day. Well, that's, that, but that's like 20% more. Well, it's yeah. a huge improvement in productivity. And, and, and what, in this case, you know, they were working in a sort of a regulated industry, so that, that did slow them down a bit. And, it's, if you, it's, it's sort of spiky. So on a good day, you may still write 400 lines of code, but then on another day, you may write zero or throw out those 400 lines of code. And so then when you average it over the whole life of the project, it's not very much at all. And here's another one where they worked it out, and this was 29 lines of code a day. And I think that one might have been the guy who wrote NPM, he was looking at one of the projects he did. So, you know, again, not, not a stupid developer. It's not that he's an incompetent developer, and that's why he's only achieving 29 lines of code a day. It's because stuff. So then again, you know, we sort of say, okay, well, we're solution-oriented. Let's, 
let's try and fix that. Did your boss ever say to you, bring me solutions, not problems? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's why you're a manager, is you're supposed to fix my problems. So, like, like all of us, people respond to incentives. So what if we try incentivizing producing lines of code? Will that get the developers past that, you know, sort of 12, 29, 10 lines of code a day? Well, I found another, another anecdote on the internet. Um, so this is a, a true story that I found on the internet. <laughs> Written by a dog. <laughs> And, and it was a team where they decided to up the team's productivity. They were going to pay the team for lines of code. They were going to give them bonuses. So anybody want to guess what happened? <laughs> Everyone guessed what happened. <laughs> Everyone guessed what happened. What they did, the first thing that they did was some refactoring. So instead of something like this, they said, we, we can make this more profitable. We can do that. <laughs> Same code more money. But then they looked, they said, we also, we feel comments are very important, but we don't want too much noise in the code. So let's work on the appearance of our comments. And what they did is this. <laughs> they put their comments through an ASCII art generator to make pretty comments. Incidentally, very profitable comments. Very profitable comments. Um, and so, you won't be surprised to hear that this experiment in this company lasted one day. And then people looked at what was happening to the code base and said, oh no, we need, we need to try something else. Um, so let's try, let's try a different solution to get us writing more code. Because we all know it. That's AI. It's, it's 2024. We have yeah. to mention AI. They, they told us in DevOps UK CFP, if you don't mention AI, you don't get accepted. So we're like, let's talk about AI. Obviously, AI can help us write lines of code. That's what they keep telling us, right? Copilot is there to write lines of code. Totally. So let's see. Let's see. This is a recent example. Um, I wanted to get um, a piece of Quarkus code. And so I, I gave it a little description. And the first thing that came out was pretty correct code and it saved me typing. Um, you probably can't see that very well, but you'll see why it's so small in a moment. Because I was pretty pleased at this point, and you know, the AI was doing its thing where the lines come out one by one, and then it kept going, and it started adding getters and setters. And what, how many of you are using Quarkus? A few hands, maybe. So those of you who are using Quarkus will know that one of the things we really try and do with Quarkus is not have too much code. And so if, how many are using Panache? Same hands, cool. So with Panache, the whole idea is to minimize the lines of code. So these getters and setters, you do not need. But it put them in anyway. And then it kept going, and it gave me more getters and setters. And then it gave me more getters and setters. So when I first looked at this, I thought, this is amazing. This has saved me so much typing. It would have taken me ages to type all that out. And then I realized that I shouldn't have typed all that out. And if, this, if I had pasted this into the code base, I would have just created a liability because code is a liability. And so in this example, it was 70% unnecessary code. Which maybe, is, maybe Copilot is also rewarded based on lines of code. I have a feeling that's exactly it, actually. Um, I think because of the way that these algorithms work, they want you to predict the next thing. And saying there is no next thing is a very boring thing. So I don't think the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms, are rewarded for stopping early. I think they're rewarded for keeping going. So you have this sort of tendency to verbosity because they're copying and pasting from the internet, and there's a lot of internet to copy and paste from. And so I think, fundamentally, it looks like it was really productive, but if you think about it, it's the equivalent of ASCII art comments. And it, it's, this is bad, right? Like, it's not, it's not just that it's annoying, it's actually putting downward pressure. Could, can I just say we have to ignore the yeah. fact it says Visual Studio Magazine. It <laughs> yeah. says IntelliJ Idea Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If, yeah, if you're using Visual Studio Code, terrible idea. Copilot will ruin your code base. <laughs> I can't remember what the thing was for that. Right. So oh, right. it's easy to laugh at AI and 
you know, say, oh, well, all of our problems started in 2023 when we started using AI to generate code. But if you look at old generated code, like probably what all of our IDEs do for us. Don't talk about the IDEs as being old. I've got a book to sell, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how many, how many of you have had um, your IDE generate code like this for you? All of us. All of us, right? And, and again, you know, it's like, I, I have Javadoc. If I, if I have a method that says it returns a thing, the Javadoc helpfully says it returns a thing. I worked on a library where those were the published Java docs for the, for the library code. And, and I was like, as a developer reading this, I'm like, I know that's the X, Y, Z, but like, what is it for? What does it do? Why do I need one of those? It's, it's, it's not at all helpful. But we had 100% Java doc coverage on that. Yeah, the, the, I mean, that's the really problematic thing about this kind of thing is it makes it very difficult to know whether you have a problem or not. Because if you use an automated tool, it says, oh, you guys, amazing. Look, you've got so much Javadoc. Whereas if there was no Javadoc, you could more easily go through and say, OK, there's no Javadoc. I think this one should have a Javadoc. As a human, I will write some Javadoc. Because what you, what you really want from your Javadoc is is a little bit of why, a little bit of the subtlety, not just tell me what is completely obvious in front of my face. I think this is why people talk about self-documenting code, because if the method name is useful, you don't need the Java doc comments. But like like Peter Hilton said in the 97 Things talk today, he was like, the, the method name can never really encompass the why. Like, why do we do these things? What are the side effects? What happens if I call it wrong? And, and that's what the comments are for. However, that sort of thing requires someone to think about it. And that's the time that's spent. It's not the typing that's the problem. It's the thinking about it that's the problem. Oh, yeah, and that was me. Yay! And um, JetBrains AI Assistant uh, is has the ability to generate your commit message so that you don't even need to type your commit message. Which sounds Which, awesome, right? Because nobody likes typing commit messages. It's second only to comments. Exactly. It's like even worse than comments because, like, you know, it just has to be so long. I found, like, I'm a big fan of JetBrains products. Don't work for them anymore, but big fan. Thank you for giving me IntelliJ for free. Um, <laughs> but I fundamentally disagree with this. I think that this is going to make developers think, well, not think, basically. For me, a commit message has always been a way of thinking, OK, what are the files that I've changed? Did I really mean to change all those files? In this commit in particular, I've changed uh, IntelliJ IDEA settings files and a test and the application file. And I should already be thinking, ooh, that feels like at least two different commits because we're talking about configuration and testing and, and um, product, uh, production code. But in uh, the AI assistant would just say, you know, I updated project configuration, um, and it says I increased the language level, and I reformatted this test. Um, and it just chucks on the end to improve consistency and readability. Just kind of assumed that that's why I'd want to reformat the <laughs> file. But it might not be that. It might be something else. And, and uh, as a developer, I need to be looking at the commit and thinking, are these the files I really wanted to change? Is it really a single commit? And what was I trying to do? And when someone comes in later and does git blame, what do I want them to see on that changed line? I want them to see, I changed this because customer XYZ now has a different requirement and the behavior is different. And yeah, really, it, ha it, it should be something that you couldn't work out just by looking at the code. Because if you could work it out just by looking at the code, why would you even need the commit message? And I think with, with all of these, with the Javadoc generation, with the commit message generation, with the ASCII comments, with all of it, it's this sort of idea that if we have a greater volume of code, we have a greater quality of code, and we have a greater quality of developer. And, and greater productivity. We have produced more code, therefore we are more productive. That's the assumption. Mm. And, and this assumption is still baked into our tools, even though as an industry, I think probably all of us worked out quite a long time ago that lines of code really is not a good productivity measurement for people. And so if it's not a good productivity measurement for people, it shouldn't be the productivity measurement that we use for machines, for, for tools. And, and in fact, I think there's sort of a, a bigger question here too, which is what even is our job? Like, does being good at our job mean writing 
a lot of code. Is our is our job to produce code? Are we typists? Is yeah. that what we do? And this comes back down to the. Oh, I don't know if, the, if this is this article. I can't see either. Oh right. Yes. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of ourselves. So yes. What is our job? Is our job to produce code? Because if so, then surely AI will be able to do, be able to do that in the future, and IDEs and things like that. And so. This is the problem with measuring our productivity as developers is that we fall into this trap of, of thinking the job is to produce code or commits or releases or whatever. And this is, this is because we don't really know what developers are for or what they're good at or what we should be spending the time on. And we fall into this trap of thinking it's all about writing code, producing code, and AI can do that for you. Sure it can, but even with AI actually, you still need to tell it what to do, and why it needs to work that way. You still need to critique the code. You still need to say, is this stable or going to do something absolutely crazy with our, with our deployment or, or whatever it is. And, and I think it's sort of, it's a little bit bad if we think our job is to write code, but it's really bad if our management think our job is to write code. And it's really, really bad if at the executive level, they think our job is just to produce code because that's what leads to this kind of statement. So this was the, the CEO of Stability AI. And he said, within five years, there's not gonna be any human developers. And I think what this fundamentally shows is he has no idea what a developer does. and. If you dig into his statement a little bit, he did actually give a little bit of evidence for it. Um, so he said 41% of all code right now is AI generated. And I read that and I went, wow, what? Really? That, 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 that seems like a lot. Um, what he actually meant, but didn't say, is 41% of the code that is being written by Copilot currently is AI generated. But even that, you can, you can dig into that a little bit. Because this, that statement was based on this research from Copilot. And they found that Copilot users accepted 30% of its suggestions, which sounds kind of good until you realize you flip it. What this means is 70% of what Copilot suggested was complete crap that nobody wanted. But of that 30% that Copilot produced, it made up. 40% of the code base. So you can kind of do the math and you can see that what Copilot is producing is more verbose than what the human is producing just because math. Um, and that's, again, maybe, maybe a problem because when we think about lines of code as a productivity metric, if you're a developer and you produce negative lines of code, does that mean that you're a terrible developer? Oh, I love deleting code. It is the best thing. It, it is the best thing, yeah. And it, it's, it is usually really increasing maintainability. And I heard um, Martijn Verberg say once, and you know, who probably some of you know, that you, you pay your junior developers by how much code they write. Again, don't measure, pay your developers by how much code they write. But if you were going to do it for the junior developers, you want them to write code. For the senior developers, what's their job? Their job is to delete code. And so that's how you really know you've reached that level in your career, is that you know, you're doing what Trisha's doing, like going into the code base and going rip, rip, delete, delete, delete. What, what can I delete? And yet the, the, the tests still pass, the users still get everything they want, the developers have to read less in order to get what they want. I was just reading this right now thinking though, what, the idea is not to have the, developer, the senior developers just delete everything that the juniors wrote. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you could game the system really easily. <laughs> Sure. But it's, it's much more difficult to figure out which lines of code you can delete and still retain exactly the same functionality. And we're also not going full crazy in terms of like the, the, the Perl regular expressions or collapsing stuff down into unreadable blobs either. We're talking about retaining readability and functionality and so forth. And the, the problem with a lot of the stuff that the AI is typing for us is that if code is so boring and predictable and boilerplate -y, that a machine can generate it for us. Why, why is it even in our code base at all? Why does anybody need to be typing this? And this is something that, that we think about a lot with Quarkus. So with Quarkus, one of the things, because of how Quarkus works and because Quarkus does a lot of byte code inspection at build time, that means it can do a lot of things that were only possible before if you did 
kind of horrible things or accepted a really big performance penalty. And so it means that we can have this really concise, expressive programming model. So for example, with logging, one of the things that I always hate is initializing a logger because you have to say, if the class is my service, you have to say, I would like a logger for my service. And it's like, why do I have to tell you what class it we are working in. You are the computer. You know better than me what class you're working in. Because what happens then is I take this statement and I cut and paste it into a different class, and I forget to change the static initializer, and then I've just put rubbish into my code base. And so one of the things that you can do if you want to with Quarkus is you can just get rid of that. And you can just do log.info, and it will have the right information. Or, for example, if, if you're using Spring, you may be familiar with this, to, to declare your application. There is, there is nothing very interesting in this code, so we can just get rid of it in Quarkus. And we can do the same thing with things like Hibernate. So we saw a little bit of a, a preview of that, but like when you're using Hibernate, you usually end up having to do a lot of boilerplate of, of queries that tend to be the same across all classes except for a few little variations, but you can't inherit them from a superclass because it needs some knowledge of the class. What we can do with Quarkus is instead of having to have all of that, which you can't read, you can just shorten it to that, which you still can't read because I kept the font size the same, <laughs> but you can see that there, there is a lot less of it and everything else is inherited from the superclass. Or with test containers, if you're going to use test containers normally, you, I mean, they're, they're amazing, everybody should be using test containers, but there's quite a lot of stuff that you have to put in every test to say, okay, now I would like you to start test containers, now I would like you to stop test containers. With Quarkus, all of that goes away. The only thing you need to do to make test containers work in Quarkus is not configure an external data source, and then it will go, hey, I can see you're trying to test something, and you don't have a data source, and I can see you're using Postgres or whatever. I'll, I'll just start a test containers instance for you. So it's, it's really nice, and I think, you know, independent of, of Quarkus, this is the direction that we should be demanding our tools go, is non-invasive, non-clippy, non-bloaty boilerplate plate reduction. Basically, now I'm stood behind you because I was trying to get out of your oh, way. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that whole thing about measuring lines of code as productivity was just your way of like telling them the managers shouldn't freak out if they use Quarkus and there's less lines of code. It's okay. It's still productive. But there is a little bit of a problem, which is, you know, if, if you go from that and Quarkus is great, so if Fred Brooks had had Quarkus, would they have written more than 10 lines of code a day? And then actually, no, they would have written like even less than 10 lines of code a day. So we'd be worse off. Well, not worse off, but we wouldn't have fixed the Fred Brooks problem. So, did I miss us? Did we do things at the same time? No. Okay, no, fine. We are good. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, we talk, lines of code are a terrible metric, and you can, if, if the machines can generate them, then we should just not bother with them at all, okay? So, if we can start being more productive in terms of using frameworks that don't need us to write so much in terms of, and if we're not spending all of our time writing code, what is it that we are, that we are doing as developers? And it's things like spending time building code. Obviously, I work at Gradle, so we talk a lot about building, building and testing. Testing generally takes longer than building. Like, I really hope it does, because otherwise you you're don't have any wrong. tests. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe deploying or you know other things that you're going to be doing. And this is kind of part of our job, too. When we talk about what is a developer's job, and we get fixated on this idea of writing code, it is a good idea to test that code, too, and probably to deploy it somewhere where like someone will use it. I recognize there's DevOps and pipelines and so on and so forth. But the fact is that in order to write the code, there's a whole bunch of other activities that happen as well at the same time. There was a survey done in, 19, uh, 19, in 2019 about what developers spend their time doing. And this survey suggests that you probably only spend about 32% of your time writing new code or improving existing code. The rest of it is other stuff. Like, I don't want to mention the other titles because actually I would argue that testing falls under writing code, but okay, let's take that as it is. Yeah. And so really only 32% of our time is actually spent writing code. So 
perhaps, you know, if we want to optimize this, we, A, should understand if that's true for us, and B, figure out how much time we're spending doing the various things we're doing when we're supposedly writing code. So, as with any performance optimization problem, you need to measure don't guess. And I heard you say this a bunch at the DevOps uh, Belgium talk, and I love it because like, our I old boss used to say this all the time <laughs> yeah. too. And it's just like, we have gut feelings on how long we spend doing stuff or where the performance bottleneck is and all the rest of it. And sometimes those gut feelings are correct, but more often than not, that's not necessarily the case. So what you really want to be doing is you want to be measuring the amount of time that you're spending doing stuff. This is kind of what we talk about in terms of DPE, in developer productivity engineering, taking an engineering approach to developer productivity. So the first thing we should be doing is measuring how long you spend doing stuff. For example, um, Devilocity, Gradle's other tool, who knows that Gradle has two tools? Probably the Gradle employees in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so Gradle build tool and another tool called Devilocity, which is a developer productivity tool, which works with Gradle, Maven, Bazel, and SPT. And what it does is it can do things like measure how long you're spending on your build times and on your test cycles. And not just in CI, because we can probably get that information in CI, but also on your local machine. And until I started working at Gradle, I didn't even think about measuring how much time I'm wasting on things like running local builds. And I certainly never would have thought of measuring that across the whole team and thinking, you know what, we've got a team of 20 developers. The build time, even if it's something in my mind, something low, like six minutes, but probably for Quarkus, I don't know, is it shorter or longer? It, it, is, it is very long. Um, with Quarkus, we completely got frog boiled on our builds. So our builds, if you, if you include the tests, our build is now about, well, it was about 40 hours of build time. So we had to massively parallelize it, but then we kept running out of machines. And then we started using the Gradle tools and everything has got better. Happily ever after. Yeah. <laughs> but. The fact is that you don't know you have a problem until you start measuring. So you can use a tool like, for example, Devilocity, but not limited to, to figure out what, what, how much time people are spending on things. Of course, if your build times, your local build times are only like, you know, 90 seconds or 20 seconds or whatever, and I speak to a bunch of people whose local build times are like well under five minutes, then you know that's not necessarily the area you're going to optimize. Even if you do end up optimizing things like the build and test cycle time, you're still only optimizing, like let's say you can chop 30% off that. Let's say you can really optimize that. But this is the coding time still. We're still talking about the time when we write code, whether we're writing code or building it or whatever. How do we get some visibility over all the rest of the stuff that you're doing, particularly things like meetings? And my favorite one is other. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I would really like to see what other looks like. So. A lot of the productivity metrics that we look at um, have been focused around the writing new code and improving code side of things, like how many issues do you fix? How many lines of code do you write? How long does your build take? Because and it's easy to measure. Because it's easy to measure. And actually, we're not necessarily looking at the holistic view of what is really taking developers' time. And, of course, what gets measured gets optimized. So if you're measuring build times, then you're going to optimize build times. If you measure lines of code, you're going to optimize lines of code. If you measure meeting times, you can start reducing meetings. But really, you need to have a, a much bigger view. So there's a fairly new framework for looking at developer productivity, the space framework. Um, and this came out of, oh, I'm going to misquote, Microsoft Research, or it's a, it's a research activity. And so. The space framework talks about five different areas to look at in terms of your developer's productivity. And those areas are, right at the top, satisfaction and well-being, which is obviously one of these fluffy things that, you know, we know how we feel and how do you measure that by using a tool. I tell you what, let's just put a heat sensor in here to figure out how satisfied <laughs> I'm feeling today. The satisfaction and well-being, performance. Performance in this case specifically means around quality and does the, does, the, do, does the application do what the users want. So kind of the performance, of the, the performance and quality of the application. Activity, which covers a lot of the things that we've been talking about, lines of code, commits, pushes, merges, those sorts of things. Communication and collaboration, again, a bit more difficult to measure. Efficiency and flow, and I think flow is 
impossible to measure. And yet, in my mind, the most important thing on this is how easy is it for us to get into the state of flow? How often are we feeling flow? Because flow is where we're really able to actually get that work done and be really productive. And if you're a fan of Dora, space is a, is a natural successor to Dora. The lead author is the same. Right. Whereas in contrast, <laughs> you might also be looking at something like the McKinsey work on measuring developer productivity. Don't do that. It's just wrong. We're not going to go into it. We will share resources at the end which explain in detail exactly why it's wrong that you can share with your management if they are looking at the McKinsey metrics. Let's, and then I think for me, the takeaway point for the McKinsey report is if someone starts to want to measure your productivity as a developer, question the reasons for why they want you to be productive or want to understand your productivity levels. So things like the McKinsey report actually looked quite a lot. It did, does talk about space, I think, and Dora. Um, but again, we're, we're looking at activity metrics. We're looking at how, basically, how fast you type, how much you know, monkey bashing on a keyboard kind of thing you do, number of commits, number of builds, number of things like that. So, and space is a much much bigger, well, space is very big, space is <laughs> a much bigger set of things to, to measure and includes things like asking developers how they feel. Do you feel productive? Are you satisfied? Which a lot of companies I think are uncomfortable with because they're like, well, that's just feelings, right? That's not so important as metrics. But anyway, go away and have a look at this because there's a lot of interesting information in there. The other thing I wanted to talk about around this area, um, you'll see at the end it talks about efficiency and flow, but I really wanted to talk about what efficiency means and why efficiency is or is not important. So in organizational physics, which I read fairly recently, this was in the context of different parts of an organization. So you have efficiency parts of the organization like accounting and effectiveness, uh, who, things like R&D and stuff like that. So, Efficiency means to do things in the right way, repeatable, controllable, scalable. This is things like QA and accounting and finance and things like that. Effectiveness means to do the right thing, trial and error, risk taking and adaptability. So this is actually a, 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 at least 50% of what we do as developers. Are we building the right thing? Are we solving the customer problems? Are we, you know, are we taking risks and trying new stuff? Are we being innovative and creative? And the other interesting thing about this is in the book it says, unless you design against it, efficiency will tend to overpower and snuff out effectiveness. And I think we've already seen this when we're talking about lines of code. If our metric is lines of code, we can really efficiently write lots of lines of code. We could do hundreds in a day. Then we have to think about the effectiveness. So whenever we're talking about developer productivity, particularly measuring it, we need to understand there are at least these two ends of the, of, the, of the spectrum on what we want to balance. Are we, again, we've heard this before in other presentations, are we building the right thing and are we building it right? And we need to understand that those two things need to be held in balance. Uh, back when I used to work in London, I used to work with Dave Farley. And uh, Dave, when I used to pair with Dave Farley, he, I would be like trying desperately to write lots of lines of code because that's what we do as developers. Right, tuffy, 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 zap, there's lines of tuffing. But Dave, he would, he would sit there and he would, he would think about the problem. And I was like, Dave, you're, you're not typing. Are, are you working? And he's like... Were his eyes closed at the time? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And he, he was thinking about like the shape of the code is like this, and if we put it over here, and what sort of test do we need? And he would be asking questions, and, but he wouldn't be typing. And Dave is one of the most effective developers I've, I've ever worked with, but it's not because he writes loads of code, it's because before he writes loads of code, he thinks very carefully about what he's writing and is he doing the right thing. In contrast, I worked with another boss soon after that who, did, who wrote lots of lines of code and uh, three months later rewrote all the lines of code. <laughs> so, let's talk about space to think. Let's talk about like not typing. Let's talk about not doing the activity. And if we're not doing activity, then we're bored, right? Especially as developers, we have a tendency to to hate boredom, don't we? Yeah, and, and, and as well, again, you know, another sort of tip of, if you're, if you're talking to your manager about this and you go to your manager and you say, I would really like to create boredom among the team, they tend to not respond well to that, but 
the word you can use is space. You can say, I would like to create more space, mental space in the team, and that goes down better. And the reason we need mental space is so that we can do the thinking. I've been thinking about this more and more recently. It's, it's, it's not about the doing, it's about the thinking. And it's so hard to measure the thinking, and yet so much more important. Right, yes, so toil is bad. Toil being the building and the testing and the frustration and the friction and the things that get in the way of us doing our job. And so I think we could all agree with that. That's toil, bad. that's good. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's good that it's bad. Yes, definitely. But idleness and sitting around and not typing is, is good. Yeah, it's a little bit of a harder sell to explain why doing nothing is good. But there is solid science to back this up. Um, Kevlin mentioned this yesterday as well. There, there is a part of the brain or a, a network of areas of the brain that make up the default mode network. And the most parts of the brain, if you're not doing anything, your brain activity is lower. But the default mode network, when you're not doing anything, the brain activity there gets higher. So suppressing, you know, sort of doing nothing with the rest of your brain then means that this area has an opportunity to do stuff. And this area, the default mode network, is what's involved in things like creativity, in problem solving, in sort of digesting the events of the day. So it's really important that you allow your default mode network time to do stuff by doing nothing. A classic, classic way to do this is to have a shower. Um, showers are a wonderful debugging tool. I always think all offices should have showers just for the purposes of, of debugging. Um, and I'm not alone. There, there was research. Um, this research was by a shower company, so it was <laughs> slightly biased research. But they found that 14% of people, which includes me, took showers specifically for the purpose of coming up with ideas. Um, it's not very environmentally responsible <laughs> to spend all of your time in the shower, and it's bad for your skin as well. Um, so there are other things that you can do. I find running really effective for problem solving. Um, and in fact, I wrote this slide while I was running. I was like, hey, I know what the slide should look like. Um, I brought my knit in. <laughs> to prove that I really do do knitting. That is the, that's the thing that I do. And one of the reasons why I do knitting is that it, um, it frees up my mind, but it, it ties up my fingers and frees up my mind. So that, you know, because if, if your fingers are free, you're just going to check your phone or you're, mm, you're just going yeah. to eat something or you'll do something else with your hands. And if you tie up your fingers, you kind of force your brain to be like, oh my God, I don't have any stimulation right now. I, I, I'm going to have to think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy thought. Um, one challenge I did have with running was I would have so many ideas, and then by the time I would get back to my desk, I'd get distracted and the ideas would all leak away. Um, so now, if, if you are also running for work, um, voice memos on your phone save everything. You sound ridiculous when you listen back to it because you're sort of gasping, but <laughs> if you can live with that, it's okay. Um, if you don't want to run or shower, there are many other options. Um, so walking very good, gardening very good. Kevlin mentioned unloading the dishwasher. Which I, is I added laundry on the back of that laundry, because yeah. I do a lot of laundry because I work from home and do a lot of laundry and I will, I'll be like, I don't want to do the laundry. I want to fix this thing. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not fixing that thing. Get up, do the laundry, hang out the laundry and your brain will go, bing. Oh yeah, that's the answer. And, and with all of these, they sort of have a bonus, which is that at the end of it, the dishwasher is empty and the laundry is done. Or in the case of knitting, you have, you have clothes. I have actual clothes, which my <laughs> yeah. children do wear. <laughs> um, I, a very small digression of, uh, into knitting, um, because knitting seems very girly, but knitting, is, knitting can actually be used for very scientific purposes. Um, so if you are doing mathematical topology, you can knit shapes that cannot be visualized otherwise. Um, and if you are into knot theory, then you can also do interesting things with, with knitting and knot theory. But I, I love the aside. fact that I didn't even know there was such a thing as a knot theory until I read this slide. I was like, oh, that's a thing. For me, knot theory is, I can't, why, is it not, why is it a magical knot that's never invented before? Like, oh, the knitting just knots itself like that. Yeah. Knot theorists also use their special scientific skills to, uncover, to discover new necktie knots. Why do you need that? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who says science is useless? That's true. <laughs>
Oh, yes. And so um, I saw while we were coming up with the, the idea for this talk, uh, apart from the fact that obviously we just wanted to draw a lot of stuff on the slides, I was watching a Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur episode with my children. And there was an episode in that where she fast forwards through scrubbing the floors and cleaning the this and doing the that because it's really boring and who wants to do that stuff? And at the end of the episode, she realized that the, the things that what was really happening during those exercises is that she was spending time with her dad and she was hearing stories and they were talking to each other about stuff and they were kind of like, she was saying the interesting stuff happens in that dead time. It's not about scrubbing the floor, it's about all the other stuff that goes around, the conversations and the learning and the, and the brain activity. Also linked in the resources, should you wish to watch the episode. So really, you know, embrace that dead time, um, use it for problem solving, use it for thinking, use it for staring into space, because that is problem solving. And also, you are totally allowed to use the dead time for play. But whatever you do, don't just move efficiently from task to task, because you're not going to be effective. You've got to make that time for boredom, and you've also got to make time for play. And if, if boredom is a hard sell to management, play is probably an even harder sell. But play actually has a lot of business value. And it has business value in really weird domains where you wouldn't expect it. So for example, piglet litters grow faster if they play more. Um, and then in business, you know, we see really strong correlations between people's happiness and their and, and their state of mind, and, and how much work they do, how productive they are. And then the question is, okay, well, I would love to be happy at work, but how do I get happy at work? It's not just as simple as watching cat videos. I need something bigger to change. It can actually be as simple as watching cat videos. Um, research found that people who had watched a cat video had 12% greater productivity than people who hadn't. Obviously, you need the balance. If you watch all cat videos, you'll never get anything done. But fundamentally, what this is showing is that fun is good for business. There is a ton of research for this. Dora found it many years ago. Um, and for all of us, you know, we, we work in a creative industry. People don't call it a creative industry. It is totally creative. And play helps innovation. Play helps creativity. And that makes us happy. And in the... And we even measure this in the in the new framework. So, so for, example, for example, space, one of the key things to measure is developer satisfaction. In order to be productive, developers generally, developers who are more satisfied are more productive. And so we're measuring those things as well. In short, writing code makes you happy and is, makes the company profit. By all means, use this slide anytime you want to sell that to management. They'll be 100% behind you on that. And I mentioned we've known this for a long time, since the early Dora research. We've actually known this for a much longer time. How many of you speak ancient Greek? And, and There's always one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I know that the ancient Greek is a little bit challenging. Um, so here is a uh, How many of you speak Greek? Uh, two, of you. <laughs> the two of you. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't, what Aristotle said was pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. And so we tend to think of it as a trade-off between happiness and productivity, but it is not a trade-off. They're actually on the same side. It's a double win. Um, this, by the way, is a seesaw folded in half. Uh, before I drew it, I tried to find some reference images. And actually, I did find reference images of seesaws folded in half. It is, it is a thing. Um, but really, the, the the point here is that it is a double win. It is not a trade-off. Um, so, you know, sometimes we talk about co-benefits or win-win, or, um, or if you're American, you call it a twofer. Um, if you're not German, you call it an Uberwinden. But if you are German, you know that doesn't mean anything to do with a double win. But it still <laughs> sounds cool, so I include it in the slides. Um, but with with all of these, you know, really the idea is that you know it's not a zero-sum thing. We've the the way to improve performance is also to fix the other things or it's, you're just not there. Exactly. There's a, a quote from, this is from The Goal, and it says, the only initiatives that will positively impact performance are ones which increase throughput while simultaneously decreasing cost. So you have to look at, you know, it's, it's not just one thing or the other. It's not cutting costs. It's not forcing people to do more. It's both things. Reduce the friction, reduce the toil, improve morale, improve the fun, and you get more productivity. 
And as, as a counterexample, of course, we have the double win when we're happier and more productive. We also have the double lose when we use AI to generate a completely bloated code base and at the same time manage to destroy the planet. So these Don't things, <laughs> yeah, fail, fail, lose, lose. So we're, we're out of time, um, but what, you, what we really hope you'll, you'll take away from this is that, you know, be careful how you measure your lines, your productivity. Don't use lines of code. Do try and get rid of that drudgery um, because it stops you being effective. When you get rid of the drudgery, you will be happier. So it is, it is a double win. And really, you know, the, that downtime that seems like it's waste is not waste. It is actually making you better at your job. And so with that, I think we just we can share some resources. If you want the Devil Child, Devil, no, Moon, Moon, anyway, Devil Dinosaur, Moon Child, um, the, or the slides, the link is there. Um, if you want to win a if copy of If you want to win book. the last remaining physical dead tree copy of the book, it's the purple QR code. I will pick a winner either before the end of today or first thing tomorrow morning, and you could pick the book up from the Gradle booth uh, probably first thing tomorrow morning if you're going to be here. And with that, thank you all very much. Thank you.